It's been quite a long time since I've recorded a video and I kind of got busy because I was at work uh, this term and then I tried balancing like social media, having fun with friends and the gym. So, and then I had to grind a lot of lead code because next term I'm going to find another job. So I was kind of busy and I, I thought that sharing what I learned at owner or like the software company that I worked at um, would be pretty useful for people who I guess want to work at a startup or something. Just a preface, like owner is a startup that was acquired by RBC. And so basically when I got my return offer for RBC, I worked, uh, I got selected or like they just put me into this team under RBC ventures. So I guess like a bit of context, so RBC obviously is a big company, so they have multiple like, I guess, uh, sectors where there's like different types of companies that were within those sectors. So we have like RBC Borealis, which is like AI and all that stuff. Then there's like RBC Ventures, which is what I'm working in. And that's pretty much like anything that's rel relatively like uh, been like acquired or like just newer things like core RBC or core bank is just like. Um, it's really slow. Everything's a kind of old tech. Like, usually it's not desirable to work there. So, I was kind of got like lucky that I did it. Um, and then there's like capital markets. So, everything but core banking is pretty good. Um, you'll find a lot of like fast paced things. Um, everyone's like using more like newer tech. So I got placed in RBC Ventures. So the most of these startups are acquired by RBC. And so I worked at a startup within there called Owner and it's been, yeah, so it's been around for almost like seven years or something, maybe a little longer than that. Um, and yeah, so I'm part of the, one of the pods in, within the technology operations team. And so I definitely learned a lot, but yeah. Okay. So the first thing and something that I guess is really common among like startups and startup culture is startups move fast so relative to i guess like core bank rbc or like other companies that are really big we were moving pretty fast like a lot of times we would have multiple tickets on our jira board um it was very packed like everything was always packed um and like i guess i can also go into detail about what i actually do as a software engineer so um, part of this is usually you go um, to work, right? And then, so I guess a typical day would be like we would go to stand up or you'd get some work done before the stand up meeting. And you just basically report what you've done, what you're going to do today, what you, you know, need to figure out, stuff like that. Anything that relates to like work and just like updating your product manager on what you have been up to. So after that, usually, Let's say you get signed a ticket, right? So we use a thing called Jira and it's made by Atlassian. I'm not sure if you know what that company is, but a Jira board is basically everywhere, everything that, um, it's like a Google calendar, but kind of for like work and all the, instead of like things you got to, to do for yourself, you have the to do for all your tickets. So you'll have like a bunch of tickets and these tickets are created from like a bigger project. So let's say you have a big idea, right? You would usually summarize it down into like, little sections of like work. And then in those sections, you would have like each task, right? To finish this entire section. So those tasks are like tickets. And so every ticket you have is gonna be placed on this Jira board. And the entire team obviously gets a certain amount. We, we do like story points or something and we estimate them. And so basically they all go into this Jira board and each week you pick up a new one or you continue working on the current ones. And the goal is just to finish all the tickets you have in your current sprint, which is a two weeks work uh, worth of tickets um, within like the time that we estimate and so usually you go about this by like cloning the repo that you want to work on and then you'll make code changes create a PR so you usually make a branch and then you make a pull request and a pull request is basically like a request to like integrate new code into the main code base so you do it as a branch so it doesn't affect anything in the main code base and you make changes, you keep on pushing this PR, and then you need to get reviews when you're done. So you obviously test it, and then you'll get other people to test it, and then they'll review your code. And then once that code is good, then you merge it into the main uh, code base. 
And so that's pretty much what the flow of my work looks like um, every day or like, I guess like every two days or everything. Back to a uh, topic on like startups. So startups move really quickly. So we would do multiple tickets. I remember I had like 10 tickets on my Jira board at one point. So it's definitely a lot more fast paced. Um, when I was working at RBC in the summer, it was not like that at all. It was so much more chill. I could actually like just relax. Like at the startup, I kind of, you always kind of have to be working, especially because I'm not at the level of the full-time software engineer. So I kind of had to always be working. I would usually get to work really early and then leave late. This is a startup, right? They're trying to push, they're trying to ship features really fast. They're trying to get everything out there. The next thing I learned, which was very crucial for like my character growth and like development within like technology and like software engineering, I guess, I learned real web development. And when I say real, I mean not fake web development where they make you work on one button and expect you to learn, you know, do this for the entire term. So usually, I guess like big companies, they have this tendency to not really trust you with the work you're doing. And so they give you some like really crappy work that doesn't really like relate to, you know, like much of what you're supposed to actually be doing. And it kind of like screws you over because, you know, you're not really learning much you don't contribute to the co company and you're just like useless flesh if that makes sense like a, I guess they just you're just there for the paycheck and it doesn't really make you feel good doesn't help the company doesn't help your team so it's just kind of a waste of time in my opinion but yeah like at this company I actually worked on a lot of the main like parts of actually building the website so we were building it like inter so the main thing that I worked on throughout the internship was we were trying to build a new um, internal system right for our uh, like product managers and like customer service people so working on this main thing we built the entire thing from scratch so we created a new repo me and my pod were working on it so i worked on like dvr fixes um, implementing new controller routes um, like updating like front end stuff or just like Mostly back end, I guess like most of this internship was primarily focused on back end because when me and my boss did chat, I, I told him I wanted to learn a lot more back end because the front end stuff I could learn on my own. So that was what I mostly learned. And I think like we use different technologies. Like I use like Nest.js or yeah, not, not Nest, but I used Nest. Um, I used express node um we worked with like usually like new work with new technologies such as like swagger like i've never used that before for controller routes it was pretty cool um postman um and i learned a lot about the terminal like terminal was one of the biggest things like i learned how to like kill terminals like using like the lsof dash i command thing um I learned about Redis, I learned about RabbitMQ, Postgres, um, Docker. I had to set up Docker for like basically the the entire thing along with my manager. So that was pretty cool. Um, and then on top of that, I also implemented like features where it would call like other repos and like other, other services within those repos. So it was kind of cool. Um, a lot of the stuff that I was doing, I didn't necessarily do on my own. And I learned a lot. I definitely learned a lot um, about backend and how to write code, how to write good code, clean code, and follow design patterns that the team and I agree on. Along with this, so this whole startup culture thing, right? Another thing I learned is when you go to work, everyone kind of is really chill. Like chill, not as in work, but as in no one's dressed up in a suit no one's really like super formal. Like, I think that was the biggest shock to me, I guess. I didn't expect this to be like that um, because we do work within RBC, right? So I was assuming like everyone would pretty come pretty well dressed, like with at least like a dress shirt or some like polo, right? But now nah, like most people actually just come in with like a t-shirt and some sweats and like, and I've seen slippers, like anything, like that's some of the crazy stuff like I've seen worn uh, to work. So that was like a big shock to me. Um, I still wore relatively like formal, like I wore like dress pants. I sometimes wore a polo, but 
that was something I also learned that was pretty cool. Like, I guess it was also new to me and surprised. Um, you didn't expect it to be this chill, right? Because we weren't really working on our own. We were working within RBC. So it was a bit different, but yeah, that, that was something definitely new to me. Okay, another thing I learned was that a lot of times I would mess up. I would, I guess not mess up as in like totally mess up, but I would write code that I guess wasn't as good. And then I would have my boss review it and then he'd point out a lot of mistakes. And so like through this, I feel like I learned a lot. So definitely learned a lot about web development. And again, this is like part of that like whole coding web uh, websites and stuff. So like things like DVRs, like the vulnerabilities you see, like when you create an application, like when you're doing your own personal projects, you tend to not really um, like look at that stuff. Like you don't really pay attention to that stuff. You don't, you never, like I don't think anyone solves vulnerabilities for their own personal projects, at least that I know of. Cause it's just like no one's using it that much that you need to actually resolve those dependency vulnerabilities, if that makes sense. So you never have to encounter a situation where you get stuck on something like that. So like that was something that when I went to work and they asked me to solve these, like it was like seven tickets or something on like seven different repos. I was a bit like shocked that we even had to like, I get it. Like, but a lot of these were like internal services. Like no one on your team is going to try to break your system. Like sometimes they didn't understand it, but it pushed me to do a lot of like thinking outside of the box too. And like also like doing a lot of research because the DVR fixes are kind of weird. Like you don't exactly know what's going on. There's not really a clear solution to everything all the time. So that was really new. Second last is communication. So a lot of times, so at Waterloo actually, we get ranked um, based on our co-op. So you kind of need to like communicate with your boss about that stuff and you, you kind of want a good rating, um, preferably like an excellent or outstanding. So throughout the term, I actually communicated a lot with my boss. I told him, I was like, you know, like I want to get this, like what do I need to do to get excellent? Um, my boss is great. I love him. Like he was actually really nice throughout the entire term. Definitely pushed me to do a lot. Um, it was great. Like I actually, this is like the first time I actually like, you know, liked my boss. So it's kind of crazy, but I think communication is really important. Like I also had my first time ever demoing, um, in front of the engineering team, right? Like I, I've now done like three or four, but, um, they, it's, it's been like a while, but I remember the first time I demoed, I guess I wasn't the best because I didn't speak loud enough. There was a lot of issues like, like they all understood, but usually it's not taken too seriously, but that is something that I guess like I could take into consideration for next time because when you are demoing, because when you are demoing what you've done, you kind of want to explain it well. You want to explain not really what you've done because people can look into the code and understand what you write, but more so like why you do the things you do and like how that is gonna affect the team or how it's like helping the entire team. So that was something that I learned. Um, and like just in general, like communicating with your coworkers or any person that's trying to help you out, like that was a big thing. So a lot of times I would run into errors, right? And I'm like, oh shoot, like I don't know how to do this or I don't know how this, mach uh, this repo works. I don't know how this technology works. So I have to go to people to help. And a lot of times they would remind me like, you know, like we don't know all the context you do, but we don't. So when you come to us with a problem, you got to kind of explain to us what's going on, explain all the things you've tried, then ask like what to do. Because a lot of times they're going to suggest you something that you may have already done, or they don't know enough to actually give you an answer. So that was a big thing that I learned as well. So communication was definitely important. Um, like no matter where you go, it's actually really useful if you know how to talk. Um, no one really like if you if you're super smart but you can't communicate the ideas you're or what you've done, it's kind of useless because no one will ever know what you've done. If that makes sense. Okay, the last thing. So obviously AI is a thing now. There's so many AI tools. I think that it was crazy because when I went to my internship, I was a bit scared because RBC is known for like blocking AI stuff. Because when in the summer I literally had no access to any AI. Um, even here. So RBC is kind of like super protective, obviously as a bank, right? So my RBC laptop doesn't have access to any online resources. So I couldn't use ChatGPT. I couldn't use like 
Claude, I couldn't use all these like online tools that you hear everyone talking about uh, that use AI. So I got stuck with Copilot. Copilot is pretty good, but it's just not as efficient as other tools. And one thing I did realize throughout this internship was that, you know, you can't really like use uh, like AI, especially with work. And that was one thing that I realized because everyone's like, oh no, AI is going to take over your job. AI is going to do software engineering. No, like it, it still cannot. There's still a lot of limitations because obviously if you're working at a company, but you're not going to copy and paste code into the chat GPT. It's only company code, right? You're not going to just like start putting the secret keys and like GPT query uh, and then like ask it to like do stuff for you. Like that's not how it works. You don't want to do that. Um, and so what I learned is that code basis, even at like a startup, like at owner, the code base was so big, like I didn't even know where the code was for a lot of the things. And so like when I was implementing controllers or something, I'll be implementing code. I'll be like, hey, where is this thing? Like, where is this file that I see in this repo that should be used here? Um, like, I don't see it right. And I would assume it's not there and I would implement it myself. And then just to find out when my coworkers were reviewing it, there was already code there that I could have just used, but I just couldn't find it because the code base is so big. And this is a startup. So think of like the bigger companies, probably have a, like a 10 times, 20 times bigger code base. So that was one thing that AI could not do, right? Because AI Copilot in your VS Code terminal or on the side of your VS Code interface, it's not going to be able to read the entire code base. Like there are some extensions that can, but even then they're not that efficient to do so. There's just too many files. Like I think there was like, there was at least like a thousand files in one of the code, uh, in one of the repos that I was working on. Like there's no way you're going to be able to go through all of that. So you kind of had to like do it manually and like trace or ask like people that already have worked on these code bases because AI can definitely not like do that for you. And then another thing is that like AI is guessing like a lot of time it would guess stuff. So I basically towards the end of my internship, I started relying more on Stack Overflow, GitHub issues and like the stuff that people like used back then when there was no AI. And I realized like how much more effective those tools were throughout this internship than like relying on like Copilot to do the for me. The only thing Copilot was really good at was writing tests. Unit tests, but I'd slap my code in there and it would just do it for me and make the unit test good. So that was something that was useful, I guess. But relative to that, like everything else, it was kind of hard to, I had to mainly troubleshoot things and I learned how to use, and through this it was actually really helpful because I learned how to use a debugger and use breakpoints. So that's something like no one uses in VS Code for some reason, but the debugger is actually pretty good and it's really helpful. Like if you cannot use AI, um, I think it's actually better than AI if you know how to use it really well. A lot of learning that happened throughout this, these four months.